You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Hey there. Did you know Bakers always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Bakers app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Bakers today. Bakers, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore data. Well, today is officially PFF Day. We're going to take a closer look at who did what and how and when and where and all that good stuff. Oh, and happy December. Sitting here looking at the numbers like, wait, how many downloads do I have this month? Oh, 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 yeah. It's, it's the first day. That was scary. Well, never mind not doing this episode, packing it up. It's, it's been a good run. But uh, we did get some late breaking news. Devondre Campbell has been put on the COVID IR list thing. Um, Fortunately, or hopefully fortunately, it doesn't matter. We've got a bye week. Now, the only concern we have, aside from him still not being ready when we get back, is, you know, it's the bye week, which means people travel, they go places, they presumably see more people. Hopefully, nobody else gets put on COVID IR for next week. But as of right now... It all seems to be good news. So let's get Devondre Campbell and his uh, COVID thing out of the way. Let's get back, not next week, but the week after. Completely healthy. Hopefully we can close this thing out. Other interesting news and notes from around the NFL, starting with the NFC North. Uh, DeAndre Swift, the Lions running back, is probably not going to be playing this week against the Lions, which kind of stinks. Not that anybody really expects a big upset here. I feel like the Lions have had their chance for upsets, and they have continually failed to upset those teams, close as it may be, and uh, I just don't really see the Vikings being that team. Anything could happen, again, especially this season. A lot of super crazy games, massive underdogs winning games, but obviously that doesn't help the cause. Either way, huge Lions fans these this week. Strangely, also Bears fans this week. So we are not rooting for the Packers, and we are rooting for the Bears and the Lions. This is a very weird week. With that said, sort of tit for tat, Dalvin Cook is not playing. Talked about it already, but Dalvin Cook, um, he's going to be out for at least two more weeks. Now, the, the optimism for the Minnesota Vikings is that they have some winnable games the next two weeks, so they're hopeful that they can get them back for the stretch run. In other words, we can win without them, we can lean on Kirk Cousins, and then we'll get him back for the games that matter. To be fair, though, they could probably hold him out for three weeks because their games are Detroit, um, Pittsburgh at home, which you might think possibly could be a bit of an issue, but um, Pittsburgh has completely fallen off. Their defense isn't even good anymore. They used to have one of the top defenses. They're ranked 23rd, having given up 41 points in back-to-back weeks. 41 and 41. Um, Pretty remarkable. So they kind of have three gimmies with Detroit, Pittsburgh, and Chicago. Um, Then they have the Rams coming up, which, again, Rams probably aren't as good as initially thought. But you like to have Dalvin Cook back. And then obviously after that, you have Green Bay um, in Green Bay. So that's, that's what they're hoping to get Dalvin for on top of the playoffs if they actually get there, which certainly not a guarantee. And as for Chicago, again, uh, one of the few times, maybe once a year we end up rooting for the Bears because they end up being bad enough that um, we need them to beat another team more than we need them to lose. Unfortunately, this is a super beat-up team. Um, Apparently, Justin Fields is likely going to play, which already is a bad thing. Um, As I've said, and it's, it's really not even close, Andy Dalton has been the better quarterback so far this year. On top of that, though, Justin Fields is hurt. According to Ian Rappaport, uh, MRIs showed that Justin Fields has, quote, a few cracked ribs. So here's the situation. I think this is a perfect excuse to not play him. And there's no re- listen, your season is done. Uh, 
And I under, I fully understand that Nagy and, and and Pace, I guess, although he probably doesn't have much say in this, they're just trying to do something to save their jobs. But if you want to save your jobs, put in Dalton and give yourself a chance to win. Not that you have a good chance, but give yourself a chance. But this is your excuse to say, look, the kid's banged up. You're not going to say this out loud, but your season is done. Pre- preserve and protect Justin Fields. Why, why are you going to get him beat up? Why are you going to play him with broken ribs? For what? You're going to lose to the Cardinals, and you're not going to the playoffs. What's the point? Why are you pushing him into a game? I don't, I don't know, man. I don't understand anything they do. But we'll see. Um, I would be fine with it if they want to play fields just from the standpoint of, I mean, if you're going to lose, you might as well lose in spectacular fashion and make Bears fans feel bad about their team. But, I mean, that it's just, again, it's one of those situations where I want to say there's no way they're playing Justin Fields because you look at all the available information and there's only one right answer. And to think that they're even considering playing Justin Fields is stupid. However, teams on occasion have been known to do things that are not super smart. So we'll see how it goes. There's also a question mark surrounding Roquan Smith. I have not heard any updates, and we probably won't hear any updates until, uh, well, today. But um, he was forced to leave last week against the Lions and and may not be playing in this game. So I don't really know what his status is going to be. We'll see. I, I I know the biggest thing Bears fans want is for him to be fired after this game. Um, I think it's possible, but I also think it's iffy. If, if if there really was talk about firing him on Thursday, which again, I think if they lost on Thursday, there was a good chance he ended up getting fired. Um, but this is kind of a tough one. I think if he gets fired after this game, then it's pretty clear that he was just always going to get fired. Like this is just a thing that was always going to happen. And Because come on, it's the Cardinals, dude. It's one of the top teams. You're not expected to win. Uh, your quarterback likely is sidelined. Again, he's probably not actually the better quarterback, but whatever. As far as optics are concerned, nobody's looking at this going, dude, Matt Nagy's trash. He lost to the Cardinals. Strangely, that's exactly what happened to Mike McCarthy. But um, you might be better off waiting until next week when you get beat by the Packers because that's just an inexcusable sin, and it'll make the, the Bears fans feel a little bit better about it. Because you know it feels bad to lose to a division rival. You know Bears fans hate the Green Bay Packers more than anything else. And losing to the Packers, which is, I mean, come on. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Try to keep an open mind, but let's not be silly. You're, you're, you know you're going to lose to the Packers in Green Bay. Coming off, well, I shouldn't say that, though. Coming off a bye, the Packers suck. I don't know. We'll see. But that would be a good opportunity, at least to hedge it, to be like, look, if we lose, we can at least salvage the situation by firing um, Nagy, and then Bears fans will say, yay, we're going to be good again. Because again, they put all their all their eggs into one basket all the time. And I'm sure it's not just Bears fans, but they have a, a real big track record of this. And right now, all the eggs are in the Nagy basket. And as soon as he gets fired and we hire somebody else, it's great. And <laughs> the, the kind of funny thing is, they're so dug in and entrenched with um, uh, Justin Fields in a way that they never really were with Mitch Trubisky. Before it was, if we just had a quarterback, if we just had a quarterback, if we just have a quarterback. They tried Trubisky, Trubisky wasn't very good, and they moved on real quickly. They're like, this guy's trash. They're so dug in on Justin Fields is really good, and if we just find a good coach, we can fix this, that it doesn't matter who you hire, and it doesn't matter how good of a coach they are. If Justin Fields is not good, they're never going to come around to the fact that Justin Fields is not good. They're just going to want that coach fired. And round and round we go. So I don't know. And I and I, I don't know why you wouldn't fire Nagy. Again, I don't even necessarily know how much is his fault. I know Bears fans think it's roughly 97%. I think that's silly. Not saying he's a good coach, but I just, I don't know. I, 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 I see a bad roster playing bad football, and it's not that surprising to me. I think the defense collapsing has to do with losing, first of all, players and talent. Second of all, you lost the guy that built this defense because he got pieces that he needed for his defense, and he executed it really well. And since then, you're on your third defensive coordinator, going from Fangio to, uh, what was it, Pagano to Desai? And it's just, it's not working. Yeah, well, the offense isn't working either. Well, yeah, you got a rookie quarterback who's playing bad bad football, a really bad offensive line. Your uh, star wide receiver has played like garbage all year. Your running back has been hurt all year. You don't have any reliable tight ends. I mean, it's pretty much Mooney. And what? Robinson's not good. Offensive line isn't good. Quarterback isn't good. 
Uh, running back is good, but not there very much. And when he is, he has nothing, nowhere to work. Again, no tight ends, no other real wide receivers. What do you want the offense to do? And again, it's not, well, it's because Nagy's so bad. No, Allen Robinson has been a great wide receiver since forever, even under the tutelage of uh, his current head coach. I don't think it's scheme. And again, Mooney's playing with good football players still play well and still grade out well. If you can't find a way to make that productive, that's a separate conversation. If anything, I think the biggest failure of Matt Nagy is, is the culture. Everybody that's there doesn't want to be there and wants to leave. Probably a big contrib- contributing factor to why everybody's playing a lot worse. Allen Robinson begged to get off this team and you wouldn't let him. And now he's not playing very well. That's weird. But anyways, man, yeah, that's the theme. Um, Everybody's banged up because it's late in the season, and that's what happens, and it's nice to get a a late bye. Not saying it won't happen to us also, but it kind of stinks to be, for example, the Bears to just come off your bye week and be like, all right, we're healthy, and now your quarterback gets banged up, your linebacker gets banged up. I mean, people just right back on track, just getting getting wrecked, and there's (laughs) there's no more help coming. Anyways, um, why don't we start off the PFF thing by looking at actually some other teams i.e. the NFC North. I figured I, I, we should probably do this because, first of all, it's it's we're going into, what, week 13, and we haven't really done it at all aside from a couple of passing glances and obviously our upcoming opponents, but um, I kind of want to just give an overview of how they're doing. First of all, the quarterbacks. Uh, you've got Mr. Andy Dalton and Justin Fields. Andy Dalton has a 75.5 overall grade. Justin Fields with a 64.2, which isn't bad. Um, considering how poorly he had done, but that's largely because of weeks eight and nine, um, which everybody was very excited about. 76 overall grade against San Francisco, and then Pittsburgh, he had his 90.5 overall elite game. And then unfortunately for him, fell back off to about a 58.7, which, you know, it still seems to be an upward trend when you consider he was 40s and 50s for a a good portion of the season, and um, at least his fall off was like a a 60-ish. I don't know. It, it, there's not a lot here to work with, and it's so volatile. I mean, the week before his 70 was a 36, so it's hard to really put your finger on it. Um, Andy Dalton has been relatively, I shouldn't even say consistent, but his lowest was a 59.9, which is probably higher than Justin Fields' third best game. And he also had a elite game, 92.4. So even when you look at it and say, well, Justin Fields, look at the potential. He had a 90.5 overall game. Dude, Dalton had a 92.4. So, I mean, we can talk about potential if you want, but we, we're kind of in putting ourselves in a position where we think Andy Dalton has the potential to one day be a great quarterback, and I think we answered that question about 15 years ago on him. It's funny, I meant to be hyperbolic, and that's not far from, far from off. <laughs> He's been in the league 11 years. Left tackle Jason Peters, who's kind of a presumably a short-term solution because they just drafted a guy, um, but Jason Peters... Still a good football player somehow, despite being 40 years old, but clearly is not the same guy that he was. He's at a 75 overall grade, which is fine, but uh, also very inconsistent. It's every other game. He he hasn't had two back-to-back games in which he graded out in the 70s or higher this entire season. So um, impressive for 40 years old. One of the the all-time great tackles in the NFL, Jason Peters. But... um, Especially since the dude was an undrafted free agent by the Buffalo Bills in 2004. That's crazy. That's super crazy. I can't have it. Well, and anyways. Um, decent guy to have at left tackle, but not the same guy he was. At left guard, they've had Cody Whitehair, who's grading out his average, which is, again, Cody Whitehair was very promising for the first several years and has just been kind of a disappointment ever since. Sam Mustafer at center is just straight garbage. And James Daniels, likewise, uh, second overall or second round pick. Uh, a lot of hype coming out, but just has not really done very well. And then at right tackle, it's just been a hodgepodge. They've had one. They've had five different people play right tackle, including uh, Lakivius Simmons, who has a 30 overall grade. Alex Bars, 45 overall. By the way, Simmons with a zero pass blocking grade. Bars with a 18 pass blocking grade. Elijah Wilkerson has played nearly 100 snaps there. He's graded out the highest. He has a 54 pass blocking grade. Larry Borum, who I feel like Bears fans are optimistic about, uh, probably because he was just drafted, so they have to pretend that he's good. But a fifth round pick, uh, 54 overall grade so far. He's not good. And then Jermaine Effetti has been the primary guy there, not by much, but he's been there more than anybody. Um, he was out injured, which is why Borum came in. 
But the bottom line is it's bad and, and, and nothing's changing. There's no um, real reason to believe it's going to get much better. Long term, short term, anything. Well, what about Tevin Jenkins? What about him? I just said the left tackle is the one issue, one area that isn't that bad. Even if he ends up being a great left tackle, you, you've had pretty good left tackles for several years, even going, I mean, again, you drafted this guy replacing a pretty solid left tackle. There, there's potentially a minor upgrade if he's really good. If, not when he becomes a pro bowl tackle, if he becomes a pro bowl tackle. Looking at their top four receiving options, Darnell Mooney, Cole Komet, Allen Robinson, and Marquise Goodwin in that order in terms of how many uh, passing plays they've been a part of. Darnell Mooney, um, seemingly a, still a pretty solid wide receiver. He's had, uh, not only is he grading out quite well, but he's been pretty consistent the last four weeks just as a reliable option. Again, it's not as though everybody grades out poorly because it's a bad offense. If you're a good player, you get good grades for doing good things. That's how this works. It's not It's not statistics. It's not what are your receiving yards, and therefore that's how you grade out. Although there's generally a correlation, there doesn't have to be. Um, the number two guy, Cole Komet, again, maybe some potential here. His grade overall has gone up since from 2020 to 2021, from a 57 to a 67. And his last three games have all been fairly good. He had an elite grade against Pittsburgh, 66 overall against Baltimore, and 80 overall against Detroit. So it doesn't mean a ton, but for a guy that graded out in the 40s pretty much every single week to have three games um, that are all pretty good, including an elite game and an 80 overall, um, basically three of his top five games the entire year have been the last three weeks. So some positive development there, but far, far, far from being a very good, consistent tight end. And, and the bigger issue is that he has a 28 overall pass blocking grade. So um, for a guy that's 6'6", 260, you kind of hoped that he would be an everything kind of a tight end. That's what the hope was. He'd be sort of a blocking, receiving, strong, physical, whatever. It just, it hasn't really materialized. Allen Robinson, as I said, has been a massive disappointment. He's had two games in which he graded out well against Detroit and against Pittsburgh. Otherwise, 50s and 60s literally every week. Allen Robinson is 28. He's having by far his worst year um, in a long time, but technically ever. As a rookie, he had a 69.4 overall grade. and In 2016, it was a 69.8. Right now, 67.6. So he's been prone to a couple uh, bad games here and there, or bad seasons here and there, but this is, this is real bad. And, you know, I don't know what it is. But the idea that at some point he's going to figure it out and become a good Chicago Bears wide receiver ever again is very low. Maybe he'll leave and find his, his way somewhere else. Maybe he never will, but I'm fairly convinced he will never be a really good Chicago Bears receiver. And finally, Marquise Goodwin is just what Marquise Goodwin is. He's a 60 overall grade kind of a guy. That's what he is right now, 65 overall grade. He's just, he's not great. And then looking at running backs, strangely enough, as much as David Montgomery does uh, get a lot of uh, attention and whatnot, and he grades out fine. He's actually got the third highest rushing grade on his team. Khalil Herbert is number one. Damian Williams is number two. David Montgomery is number three. Um, on top of that, the negative for David Montgomery has been the inconsistency. It's literally been every other week. Here are his grades for the season. And no, it's not because of injury. I mean, it's just, it is what it is. It started since week one and it's continuing now. 61, 71, 63, 78, 59, 72, 61. It's literally every week, 60, 70, 60, 70, 60, 70, 60, technically 59, but we'll call it 60. I'll round up for him. That's not great, right? I mean, this, this is one of the guys, again, I believe they traded up for him because that's all they know how to do is trade up for guys that they think are going to be studs that aren't actually that good. And um, then they just don't have any more picks because they traded everything away. It's the reason why they got a quarterback, a tackle, and then didn't pick anybody else until the fifth round this past year. So, but again, this is another guy that everybody just assumes, or, or I, I shouldn't say, but Bears fans are positive he's going to be a star. He's fine. He's a good running back, just like the majority of teams in the NFL have good running backs. Packers do, the Vikings do, the Bears do. Not sure about the Lions necessarily, no offense to Jamal. Most teams have a guy that's pretty decent, but um, to compensate for how bad this team is, you need this guy to be kind of elite, and he's hasn't proven to be. I mean, last year was clearly a better year than this year. Now it's because of Nagy. It's because of the offensive line. Once we get that, okay, well, whatever. First of all, you have to prove that you can fix it. It's not just a gimme that, well, we'll just get a new coach and a new GM, and then the coach will be great, and the GM will just go out and get stars, and we'll replace. Okay, go do it first. 
And then finally, looking at their uh, defense right quick. The top defensive tackle, not necessarily in terms of talent, but in terms of the guy that's played the most, in other words, he's been healthy and, and whatnot, is uh, Bilal Nichols. And Bilal Nichols is uh, he's a fifth-round pick that plays like a fifth-round pick. I mean, he's, he's similar to like a Dean Lowry, I guess. He's prone to have good years. He's prone to have good games. But more than likely, he's hasn't been super great. His career grade, 75, 52, 71, 60. So 60 overall so far this year, mostly been pretty bad. Hasn't had a good game since week six against Green Bay. Second on this list is Angelo Blackson. Angelo Blackson is a terrible football player. Always has been, always will be. Uh, 51.8 overall grade so far this year. That's actually his highest in three years. Um, 53 run defense, 38 tackling, 57 pass rush. So he's really bad. Third most snaps is Akeem Hicks. Again, not because of talent necessarily, but because of injury. But Akeem Hicks is 32 years old. Uh, He's another guy that's been trying to force his way off the team. But then toward the end, when he realized he wasn't going to be let go, he begged to be given a long-term extension because he knows he's 32. And at the end of the day, I just need money. Not need, but, you know, I just need another contract. And um, I don't want to have to prove that I'm still a good football player. I want to get locked up now. He didn't. And um, it's been a bad year, and it, it was last year, too. Right, so so he had his 2018 spike, 91.7. That was always a fluke, but he was always kind of a 70 overall kind of guy, very over, very overrated. You know, always treated like he was an 85, 90 every year kind of guy. He never was. Um, let, let me just read you his career grades so you get the idea. Since 2012 in New Orleans, 68, 67, 65, 70, 76, 76, 91, 76, and then so far 65 and 67. That's the last two years. So. Um, Basically, he hit that 30-year wall and um, just has not been great the last two years at all. He has 10 pressures on 130 attempts and three sacks. It's been awful. And uh, 62 run defense. Tackling grade is a 42. He's always been a horrific tackler. I mean, his last three years of tackling grades, 42, 45, and 30. So Akeem's kind of cooked. And, and this is the kind of stuff I'm talking about with the Bears. Like, we don't realize this. This this is every year your team deteriorates, right? What is it? Second law of thermodynamics? Everything breaks down over time? I mean, that's that's football. That's why it's a game of replacements, because you're constantly looking to replace people because they just keep getting worse. Well, you, you probably get a little bit better at first before you start to deteriorate, but I promise you, unless you're a kicker, punter, maybe quarterback, um, you know, w- when you hit 32, you know, a couple tackles out there for some reason, but you hit 32 things fall apart. And um, again, I just think people get so stuck in not realizing how things change. They, they look at it and say, well, the Bears are still good. They got Akeem Hicks, they got Khalil Mack, they got, and they just list all the guys that were good three, four years ago. It's like, no, dude, I'm sorry. Akeem Hicks, on top of having been injured half the year, has not been good since 2019, has not been elite since 2018. By the way, in 2019, he was hurt. So Hurt in 2019, hurt in 2021, injury prone, aged, not playing well. Akeem's cooked, man. I'm sorry. Eddie Goldman, guy that I really, really liked. Seemed like things were going really well for him, 70, 70, 65, and then 88, right, in that 2018 season. Then he fell back to a 70. So far this year, 45. Now, he's another guy that's been injured. He didn't play weeks one, two, or three. Um, he played four, five, six, seven, eight, and well, he's been playing ever since, I guess, but he didn't play one, two, three, but he's had one good game and that was against Baltimore. So far, 44 overall grade. I don't know what the problem is. I'm guessing part of this has to do with their defensive coordinator. Again, it, it's 2018 was an outlier, but I tend to think this is a 70 overall guy. The fact that he's at a 45, either he's got a serious lingering injury or this new defensive coordinator, um, is running a scheme that is very different than what these guys need. They're having the exact opposite issue than uh, as what we are having, where we've got guys that are finally playing in position. They're finally being used properly. The defensive tackles here are, are terrible. And uh, Mario Edwards, the exact same thing. Here are his grades. Again, there was an outlier. This For some reason, this was in 2020. It just was a great situation for him. But um, 74, 66, 61, 68, 68, 90, and so far, 46. So he's a 65 overall grade kind of a guy. He's not great. He's not terrible, whatever. Um, Had an elite year last year with Chicago and so far the worst year of his career. And seventh round pick, uh, Mr. Tonga, 47 overall grade. So 
Nobody on this defensive line is doing anything good. To, to be clear, though, before we move on to the other positions, there are five out of 31 people with 70 overall grades, none in the 80s, none in the 90s. The whole defense is playing garbage football. The entire list is Robert Quinn, Tease Tabor, my guy, 40 snaps, but I'm still taking credit for that, Khalil Mack, Travis Gibson, and DeAndre Houston Carson. That's it. There are 20 out of 31 that are below 60, 50 or lower. There are 12 out of 31 with a 40 or lower grade, and there are three in the uh, 30 or lower, and there's one in the 20s. So clearly a lot are worse than are better, or than are good, whatever, whatever words are. Um, Off the edge, they are having a decent amount of success. We know, at least statistically, um, Robert Quinn, 71 overall grade, which at this point in his career, that's not bad. Uh, 33 pressures out of 269 attempts and 11 sacks. That's obviously quite solid. I don't know if it, again, maybe it's just part of how the scheme works where this is all about the edge rushers and the the defensive tackles just get wrecked. I I don't know, but uh, they're doing okay. Khalil Mack, though, is sort of the biggest issue. Even last year, people were saying, well, he had kind of a down year. He had 59 pressures on 531 attempts. That's not great. That's not Khalil Mack standard, and that's true. But he still had a 92 overall grade. In fact, it was his highest. It was tied for his best PFF grade ever last year, which is why I was not really jumping on the Khalil Mack has fallen off bandwagon because he's clearly doing something right. My assumption was the rest of the team had fallen off to such a degree that he was seeing nothing but double teams, but was still dominating. Um, He had his second highest pass rush grade ever. So the production wasn't there, although he had 10 sacks, which is, I mean, he's never been like a 15 sack guy. 10 sacks is the highest he's had since 2018. Um, He had 11 before that, 11 before that, and then once in 2015, he had 16 sacks. So, um, And on top of that, 92 run defense grade, 74 tackling, which is really high for him. Seemed like he was doing fine. Right now, 73.5. I mean, leaving aside the part where he hasn't played in quite a while because he's out. It's not, It's again, similar to Allen Robinson, this is very bad news, and, and Akeem Hicks. He hit 30. This is the first year ever. I talked about Von Miller being in the 90s all the time. I talk about um, Aaron Donald being in the 90s all the time. Khalil Mack, he did have one year with the Bears at 86, but uh, actually that's not true. Rookie also 86, but 86, 91, 92, 90, 90, 86, 92, 73 this year. This is the first year you're looking at and going, ooh, yeah, something's not right. 22 pressures again out of 176 attempts, six sacks. That's all fine. He played about a half a year, so we're talking probably not even half a year. He usually gets 500, so let's say three times that amount. I mean, he was on track for some pretty monstrous numbers, but the grades were awful. This is the first time PFF ever looked at Khalil Mack and just thought he lost a step. And on top of that, again, he's injured. So you've got Khalil Mack not playing his best for the first time ever and uh, is going to miss significant time. I'm assuming he's going to be okay to start the season next year. I don't really know. I mean, it's it's foot surgery. I would assume he's going to be okay, but Okay relative to what? And and before we wrap this up, I'm going to look at some of their contracts and stuff real quick to get an idea of who stays and who goes. But I mean, th- this is ugly. And this is why I just I, I just can't help but put my head in my hands when they start talking about, well, if we get rid of Nagy, everything's fixed. Dude, this is a disaster. This is bad. Akeem, Khalil, Robinson, this is your core. Who Who on this team is a great football player? Who? It's not Roquan. It's not your safety. It's not Khalil. It's not Akeem. It's not uh, Quinn. It's not Hicks. Certainly not Danny Trevathan. It's none of these corners. It's none of your offensive linemen. It is not your quarterback. Mooney is not an elite player. He's a good player. This is bad, dude. But again, I love the fact that Bears fans think if we just get a new coach, everything's fixed. And, and there, there is potentially some truth to some of these guys may just get better with, with a better coach, right? I mean, you, you put guys in a better situation and, and they, they thrive. But some of this is irreversible damage. Some of this is, it's just time to move on from Khalil. It's just time to move on from Akeem. It's time to move on from half our offensive line. It's time to move on from Allen Robinson. It's time to move on from Danny Trevathan. It's time to move on from a lot of these guys that, that were your core you know, whatever. Um, after that, you got Travis Gibson, who right now is the heir apparent. I mean, this is the the third on the list of, of guys in terms of snaps. 
He is only 24 years old, but he's a fifth round pick. Um, he has 18 pressures on 154 attempts. So maybe there's something here, but the odds that this is the heir apparent, I mean, right now he is the heir apparent. He is the number three. Um, but th the point is the odds that this guy's going to be the guy that takes over long term, not super promising, but who knows? Maybe he does have 18 pressures and five sacks. That's not the worst, you know, for a technically number two now with, with Khalil out. But again, it's, it's not super likely that you got your guy. Plus, you're going to need two guys. So um, after that, Jeremiah Tachu, another guy that got hurt, but just not a very good football player. He's getting kind of up in age on top of that. Um, Cassius Marsh is another guy who's old. He's 29 years old. He's never really been good at football. Sam Kamara um, is an undrafted free agent, so there's not much there. Ladarius Mack, also an undrafted free agent from last year. Uh, he's only played in one game. He's not really your future. He's not super relevant. So... You've got two older guys who I'm sure you're going to hang on to for way too long because why not? You don't have a plan B right now. And that's part of the problem with having so many issues on the team is there's so many holes to address. You can't just say, well, we'll get rid of these guys and find new guys. Okay, well, if you invest your early picks, which you don't have very many because you keep giving them away, which is why a team like yours that's so bad should be trading back, not trading up. You need more picks, not less picks, but that's a separate issue. If you do that, okay, fine. How do you address your offensive line? You're telling me tackle isn't important. You're telling me guard and center aren't important. What about wide receiver? You don't want to address that? You're not going to help your quarterback out at all? What about defensive tackle? I just read to you how all of them are horrible. What about corner? Isn't that unbelievably desperately important for your team to go out and find a good corner? No. Anyways, uh, looking at linebacker, Roquan is obviously the guy. Um, Bears fans will tell you that he's an elite player, although I think they might be coming around to the fact that that's not the case. Um, kudos to the, the... The good thing about Bears fans, there is one good thing. They do tend to dig their, their heels in and believe that guys that are not good are very, very good. However, Bears fans are also very, very critical and very, very angry people. And when, when you get to that tipping point where they watch football games and you keep messing up and you keep missing tackles and you keep giving up receptions... They're going to forget all about the fact that they've been fighting with Packer fans on Twitter, and they're going to turn around and say, I hate this freaking guy. Get him off the team. They're way more interested. They'd rather lose a fight to a Packer fan if it means they get to trash their guys on AM radio. Other fans aren't necessarily like that. I don't know if, well, maybe Vikings fans are kind of that way. There are certain fan bases that are a little bit too, I mean, maybe Packer fans are kind of that way in terms of being more interested in, in defending their guys, even that aren't very good. I guess Packer fans are kind of split, but whatever. Point is, I think they're starting to come around. But here, listen, he's never even been good. He didn't even have a 2018 bump. Here are his grades over four years. Ready? 66, 52, 67, and 53. He had one game in the 90s. He had one game at 82. His third highest grade this entire season is a 66.6. .6. That is not good, which is on brand because he's never been good. Good. Now he's got the traits, right? He's got, if you look at run defense, right? He's got that sideline to sideline ability. He's got week one, 80 overall, week five, 81 against the Packers, 86 this past week, 89. I mean, he's got some elite traits. Unfortunately, he also has a 27, a 28, a 29, and a 27 mixed in with a bunch of 40s and 50s. So that sucks. What about coverage? He's got that elite speed. He can cover. He's got a 91.9 .9 overall grade against Cincinnati, an 85.6 against Tampa Bay, an 81.8 against um, Baltimore. Unfortunately, there's also a 47, a 34, a 46, and a 33. It's not that he doesn't have the attributes to be great. It's that he also kind of sucks like a lot and like in, in a really serious way far too often, far too often. But he is the future and he's going to make a ton of money raking the bears over the coals, stealing all their money, because what are they going to do? Let him walk? Of course not. They're going to stick with the idea that this is an elite player because he is. He's, he's an elite athlete. He can do things that most guys can't do. He is the picture of what a 2021 inside linebacker looks like. He is a specimen. But production has to come into play, and it's just not there. He has so far not had one day in which run defense and coverage were good on the same day. Not one. Week one, he was good in run defense. Uh, week two, in coverage. Week three, he was garbage in both. 
Uh, he was garbage in week four. Uh, week five was run defense. Week six was run defense. Week seven was coverage. Week eight was coverage. Week nine was neither. Week 11 was coverage. Week 12 was run defense. So it's one or the other or neither. I'm sure someday he'll he'll put it together and have a complete game. He was pretty close against the Packers, obviously. Otherwise, nothing. Next on the list is 30-year-old Alec Ogletree, who's always been a really bad football player. A uh, longtime player for the Rams, played for the Giants, played for the Jets. He's got one year in Chicago. Last year with the Jets, he had a 27 overall grade. This year, a 29 overall grade. He's been horrific in every facet of the game, in every... Uh, what is this picture? <laughs> I think they accidentally put up a picture of a coach here. But anyways, Christian Jones is third on this list. Um, 41 overall grade. He's uh, 30 years old, so he's not good at football. Um, after that, you've got 31-year-old Danny Trevathan. He's been uh, out for a while. He didn't. He was out the first four weeks. This is, uh, for those that don't know, Danny Trevathan is uh, Rashawn Gary's brother. That's not true, but I'm telling you, just look at their pictures, dude. Side by side, it's the same guy. It's his older brother slash twin brother. But um, he's cooked, man. 28, 2017, he had an 80 overall grade. 2018, 73, then 61. Last year was a 39 overall grade. So far this year, he's hardly played because he's been injured, and he had a 45 overall grade, despite having a 91 and an 80 overall grade game. He played five games, was elite in one, had an 80 overall in another, and still managed to get a 45 overall because he was so trash in the other three games. He's 31, going on 32. He's massively injured. He's way over the hill. It just it just isn't working anymore. So once again, interrupting myself. This is going to be a long episode. Once again, interrupting myself. Bears fans love to talk about this fantasy in which, in the future, the Bears are the team to beat in the NFC North. Because Aaron Rodgers is leaving, that means we just automatically are better than everybody. Have I named one thing to you that sounds promising in the future? What is one thing? Justin Fields, why? Because he's young? Because he's a first-round pick? Fine, I'll grant you that. Because I don't... Because everything else is so bad, I'll just gift you a great quarterback. What else? You got one wide receiver that's pretty good. What else? Anything else? Tackle hasn't even played. I'm sorry, I'm not gifting you that one. Nothing. There's nothing. There's nothing to look forward to. But let's continue. we got two more positions here. Number one cornerback is 22-year-old Jalen Johnson in his second year. Bears fans love Jalen Johnson. They think, or at least they used to think, I don't know if this is still true, they think he is an elite player, an elite prospect. He's very, very good. And it's understandable because he's got some elite games. I mean, literally, he has two games where he graded out as elite. Week two against Cincinnati, 92 overall grade, seven targets, two receptions, um, an interception and two pass breakups, zero passer rating, right? That's fantastic. Against Detroit last week, 91 overall grade, Um, five targets, four receptions, only 19 yards, somehow gave up a touchdown, no inter... I don't know how he got a 91 overall grade. He must have just done great in every other facet. I don't know. The problem is, though, uh, after week two, 56, 63, 49, 28, 48, 70, 53, and 74, I mean, there's a couple 70s in there, but it's been pretty bad. He has a 68 overall grade. He's given up three touchdowns. He has one pick and six pass breakups. Over the last two years, he's given up eight touchdowns compared to one interception. That's not super great. So, I mean, again, it's one of those things where, well, we've seen some flashes, so maybe... All right, fine, I'll I'll, I'll give you maybe. Maybe he'll be good consistently someday. All right, congratulations on that. We are going into year three next year. You realize that, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's when Jair really became like the premier number one corner in football was year three. And there is growth here, but I mean, I'm just saying, you have to make a decision soon. I mean, there's no decision you're gonna pay him, but again, it's one of those unfortunate situations where Jalen isn't great, but he's all you got. Just imagine if our team was no Stokes, no Jair, no Razul, and like Kevin King was like our number one corner. We'd have to pay him. We would have to pay him, and probably way more than we should. Because we, what are we going to do? <laughs> that's, that's potentially where they're at if they don't find a corner that's actually good at football. Number two corner is Kindle Vildor, which is the most German-sounding name ever, or Viking name, or whatever. It's a, German, it's a Germanic Viking. Uh, he's, I don't know, he's bad at football, dude. He doesn't have a single 70 overall game. His highest grade was a 68. 
His overall grade is a 48. Last year was a 47. His worst attribute is coverage, so <laughs> not great. You know, he's, he's kind of in the 60s in run defense, 60s tackling, decent pass rusher. Unfortunately, coverage is where he struggles, which is 95% of your job as a corner. But um, the guy's given up 526 yards, four touchdowns, no interceptions, four pass breakups, 136.7 passer rating when targeted. He's just horrific. He's a 2025th round pick. And again, this is as good as it gets for the Bears. This, this, I, I, so many people just refuse to understand how unbelievably serious it is to give away your draft picks. This is why, right? If you have like two high picks and you use it to go out and get a quarterback and a tackle and you don't get another pick until the fifth round, you get Kindle Vildor to be your corner if you even get a corner. Because maybe you need an edge rusher, maybe you need a defensive tackle, maybe you need a safety, maybe you just don't like the corners that are on your board right now, which makes sense because it's the fifth round. The Rams, by the way, are going to be experiencing this in a very massive way. After that is Duke Shelley. Everybody acknowledges Duke Shelley is a really bad slot corner. There's really nothing to elaborate on. He's in year three. He's been bad since year one. Again, young guy, drafted late because we have no other picks. So we got to take a swing. I think it was sixth round they took him or something like that. Duke Shelley was taken in the sixth round. It was their third pick. Kendall Vildor was taken in the fifth round. It was their fourth pick. Second, a second, and then a fifth and a fifth and a fifth. They had three fifth round picks. They had two second round picks and three fifths. It just goes straight to fifth. 2019, they had a third round pick, a fourth round pick, and a sixth round pick. So, I mean, there's just no opportunities to get better guys because you give away all your picks. But everybody thought that they had the greatest draft in the history of the world because they traded up, again, giving away all their picks to get Justin Fields. Then they gave up the rest of their picks to get Tevin Jenkins. So the Bears have to figure out how to do all this work without, once again, a, a, a first-round pick, as usual, because they just they just keep giving those away. Uh, otherwise, 2019 sixth-round pick, Xavier Crawford. He's bad at football. Um, they've got uh, 2016 fifth-round pick, uh, Marquis Christian, bad at football. And then Artie Burns, who is 26 years old, was a first-round pick. Uh, for Pittsburgh was a bad pick. He left Pittsburgh. Chicago thought, well, maybe he'll be good. He's playing his worst year ever with Chicago so far this year. Um, hasn't hardly played, but still that's Artie Burns. Just not very good. And then finally you got safety. Eddie Jackson, uh, again, he had one good year, 68, 93, 67, 59, 56. He's actually continuing to get worse somehow, but he had one good year. They paid him a massive amount of money because he was good once. He's been terrible ever since. Um, He's just, I don't know, He's, he had one one good game, and it was a 72 overall grade, that's it. He hasn't even had, like, splash games where some, sometimes he's really good. He's just not good. He's not really good against the run, he's not a good tackler, and he's a horrific coverage safety. But he had six interceptions in 2018, so he got massively paid. Six interceptions and eight pass breakups. He's not good. He's going to be 27, he's taking all your money, and he's not giving you anything. And uh, when you have a salary cap, inefficiency is a serious problem. On top of that, they got Deshaun Gibson. Deshaun Gibson is not good at football. They've got DeAndre Houston Karsten, who again is grading out quite well, but he's 28 years old. Um, he's been real good the last two years, uh, although he doesn't play a ton. But uh, again, he's getting up in age. Uh, Deion Bush, another one, not good at football. One of the worst tackling safeties in football. He's 28 years old. So again, kind of getting up in age. And then Tease Tabor, a guy that I really liked a lot coming out of college until I saw he ran like a, a 4.62. Uh, but he's grading out fairly well, week 7, 8, and 9. I'll take it. But again, in, in summary, what in the world is this team supposed to do in the future? What do you do if you're their GM? What's the, plan, what's the game plan? I have no idea what you do. Even if, Again, even if, okay, Rodgers leaves, right? Let's just play out this fantasy. Rodgers is gone 100%, right? This is their fantasy, not necessarily reality. He's gone, no question. He's never coming back. Packers are a terrible three-win team. Okay, fine. Are you better than the Vikings? Not a chance. Are you better than the Lions? I mean, if they continue to add pieces, maybe not. Especially if one of those pieces is a quarterback that's competent. You might be in serious trouble. So even if the Packers go winless, you're at best second and potentially third if you continue to slide and the Lions uh, continue to build. Because they're in year two of the rebuild. You need to be in year one of a teardown. And if you don't do that, then you're really stupid and you're really in trouble. But anyways, we really got to take a break here because we haven't even started with the Packers yet. I have good plans. I just talk too much.
Anyways, uh, patreon.com forward slash pack underscore daddy if you want to support the podcast. Otherwise, we'll take a break. We'll be right back. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop, that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place, and you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply, awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. All right, Green Bay Packer time. Let's Now that we're done talking about uh, teams that are horrible, let's talk about the Packers. So several of these things I put up on Twitter, but uh, we'll go through it nonetheless. There were four players on offense that graded out well, which is not good, right? It's it's not good enough. We had four players with 70 or higher overall grades. We had 11 players out of 18 that were below a 60. So the offense needs to be better than this. Fortunately, the most important pieces played really, really well, and I think that's enough to carry this offense no matter what. Um the four guys were A.J. Dillon, Devontae Adams, Aaron Rodgers, and Randall Cobb, right? Aaron Rodgers, two wide receivers and a running back are just crushing it. And we're talking 77, 80, 85, and 87 overall grades. That's going to be a good offensive performance. However, not good enough from uh, Tyler Davis, only three snaps, so I guess we'll cut him some slack. Uh, Yash Nyman, 59. Amari Rodgers didn't hardly play two snaps. Uh, Josiah DeGuara, 57, Billy Turner, 56, Aaron Jones, 54, Royce Newman, 51, Lucas Patrick, 43, Alan Lazard, 41, John Runyon, 38, Mercedes Lewis, 35. I'm going to highlight the negative a little bit because we all want to be excited about how good the offense is. We can't be doing this nonsense. Now, granted, the offensive line maybe gets some slack because they went up against Aaron Donald and Von Miller and whatnot. Not all of them did, but um, we can't be doing this. Lazard needs to wake up. Mercedes, you know, we'll cut him some slack because he's been uh, he's had some really good games mixed in there. But um, his last good game was week nine. Before that was week seven. His three week stretch of being dominant was five, six, seven. Then he had a bad game, rebounded in Kansas City, and it's been pretty much three bad games in a row, culminating to his worst game all season. He has not had a good receiving grade since week seven. So maybe we're asking too much of Mercedes. That's fine. Just don't be terrible. Don't be terrible. Um, you know, we, 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 we need to have a really good offense. And Aaron Rodgers and Devontae and Randall and A.J. Dillon are not going to be dominant every week. We need better play from other contributors, and we need more consistency from these guys. And we're just getting nothing. Again, I'm, I'm willing to cut some slack from the offensive line, but they can't all be horrible. Somebody's got to play well. None of them are playing well. And again, Von Miller doesn't play both sides, and Aaron Donald doesn't play all along the defensive line. He's one guy. Von Miller's one guy. It's got to be better. But kudos to those four. 
Uh, the guys that were in between, there's only three of them that graded out as average, so we might as well mention them. Equinemius at 60, MVS at 63, Dominique Daphne at 69.7. Right at the set, we might as well just say there were five guys. It's basically a 70. Kudos to Dominique Daphne. Um, that grade was entirely because of his run blocking, by the way, which is what he did most of the time. 16 out of 20 snaps for run blocking, and he had a 70 overall grade. He's the only good run blocker on the entire team this week, by the way. Uh, looking at the statistics in terms of pressures, they gave up 20 pressures on the day. Billy Turner gave up the most pressures, Evergreen. Um, but all of those were hurries, so I guess I'll tolerate that. Yash Nyman, uh, by the way, zero sacks were... See, I don't know why they... I don't understand. I don't know the nature of the sack. The only thing I could think is they're saying it was a complete coverage sack where he held it for like 20 seconds and they can't conscionably give that to anybody. I don't know how that works, but they have no sacks down here. Uh, Yash Nyman with five pressures, given up two hits and uh, three hurries. Royce, four pressures. All of them were hurries. John Runyon, two pressures, one hit, one hurry. Lucas Patrick, two pressures, both of them hurries. And Aaron Jones, uh, one pressure, which was a hurry. In total, three hits, 17 hurries. Really weird situation here is Aaron Rodgers. Um, I've mentioned before, he really struggles under pressure. He had a 76 overall grade while he was kept clean a 90 overall grade under pressure. Now, I don't expect that to stay that way. And again, this is why we need other guys to step up. But um, that is the scariest thing for anybody if Aaron Rodgers starts. Again, not only did he hit his stride, but look at a lot of these passes where he's got pressure right in his face and he's still connecting. That's what I mean by Aaron Rodgers really seemed to play well. There was just no stopping him and, and is evidenced by this. Um, six of 14, 81 yards and a touchdown while under pressure. 22 of 31, 226 yards and a touchdown while kept clean. That's crazy. See, and they do list a sack here. So it's not like they didn't record a sack. They just didn't put it down as any one person being responsible. So that's the only thing I could think is that it was a a coverage sack. I don't know. Defensively, um, there were probably lower lows, but some higher highs. If we kind of round up a little bit, there were nine of 18. So half the team had 70 overall grades, Um, starting with Preston Smith at 68.7. Oren at 68.8, Savage at 69, Ladarius Hamilton at 70, which is great. We need guys like that to step up. Eric Stokes at 70.8, which is great to see Eric Stokes kind of more regularly being up here, right? He's, again, kind of giving weekly updates on Eric Stokes. First two weeks, he was in the 70s, and it's like, dude, this guy's great. Then it was 51, 44, 58, and 56. It's like, that's four bad weeks in a row. Um, we kind of excuse that, but still not great. Since then, he's been alternating. 75, 49, 76, 32, 70, right? 32 is terrible. You don't want to ever see 32. But every other week, he's in the 70s. We're starting to, again, I like to use the analogy of a flickering light, starting to flicker on more often. Hopefully, the bye week is his down week, and he comes out hot (laughs) after the bye. I don't know. Uh, Tyler Lancaster at 75, Rashad Gary at 77, Chris Barnes at 89 overall. I had mentioned how he was flying all over the field. He had a heck of a day. Um, Mazul Douglas, not super surprisingly, but maybe a little bit because of that big touchdown, but 91.2 overall grade. Obviously, PFF was not dissuaded by one bad coverage snap out of 42, especially one in which there probably was supposed to be safety help on that play. So that's half the team that was in the 70s. As far as guys that were below a 60, that's pretty much everybody else. Kingsley Kiki was the only one at a 62. Um, Tipa Galea, 59, TJ Slayton, 56, Adrian Amos, 51, very uncharacteristic. Um, but I think it was because of his coverage. I'm, I'm willing to bet it was at, at least one of those times in which a safety bit when he was whatever. They blamed Amos for, for some of these. I mean, they, they did actually give him uh, one touchdown. One touchdown was credited to him out of three. So whether they directly blamed him for that or indirectly said he was out of position or whatever, um, I think that was part of the problem. But run defense grade was an 81, tackling was an 82. We'll get into those specifics in a minute, but uh, obviously they gave him credit for that. The biggest issue was just the coverage was not good this past week. Kenny Clark with a 50 overall grade. Everyone's going to be really mad at that because he had a sack and he had a, a tackle for a law. The problem is he had 52 plays. He had one sack, but only three total pressures. Three pressures out of 34 attempts is not a great day. And that's just pass rush. That doesn't mean his run defense. And again, we can say, well, remember that one big tackle for a loss? I do. It was a great play. In fact, he had three stops, which are tackles for a a negative play for the offense. But that's three out of 18. I don't know what happened the rest of the day, but apparently PFF wasn't impressed. 
Uh, Devondre Campbell with a 48. That's obviously not what you want to see. Um, Devondre, honestly, has he's not going to be a top linebacker for much longer, I can tell you that, based on how his grades have been. Starting in week two is when he really went off. Here are his grades from week two to week seven. 80, 70, 84, 79, 71, 88. Here are his grades since week eight. 60, 62, 67, 71, 48. I like Devondre Campbell. I'm glad he's here. He's had a great run, but he's regressing back to what he's been. He's You're seeing some of that regression to uh, the mean. So um, I'm not saying he's bad. I'm just saying the glory days of him just being a dominant player has not been a reality since week seven. Um, he's fine, but um, this was his first bad game, which is not what you want to see when there's just a general decline overall. So still like him, still glad he's here, but I'm more glad that we're starting to see some other linebackers step up like Chris Barnes and Oren Burks. And again, I do believe it's it's the scheme that's really great for linebackers. And it makes me excited for the future, not a future that says Devondre Campbell is going to be our guy forever and he's this elite player, but this is a system that apparently is great for linebackers. And I think if we can find a guy next year, second round, third round, fourth round, whatever, I think there's a real potential for them to be great. I know we're, we've been terrible. Maybe we need to take that second round swing. That's where most of the dominant linebackers get drafted in the second round. Maybe we need to really step it up and try that. Or maybe we don't need to because guys play well enough. I don't know. But it just, the point is, you get a guy like Roquan who has those traits. In a system like this, it seems like this is one of the places where a guy like that would thrive. And there's no question, as we've seen, how beneficial it is to have a really good linebacker on the team. My concern is if Devondre Campbell is intermittently good and Chris Barnes is intermittently good and Oren Burks is intermittently good, you're going to have days where we just have bad linebacker. There's going to be days where none of them really show up. And that those days are going to suck, especially coming down the playoff stretch. Um, after that, you have Henry Black, who consistently has been one of the worst players on this team. I mean, he's had one good game, but he's got a 42 overall grade, and that's pretty standard for what he's done. I mean, every, every week he's bottom three. Um, Chandon Sullivan was 17th, which is sort of out of character for him. Not a great day. And then Dean Lowry sitting down here dead last. Dean Lowry is either a solid contributor or is just terrible. I don't know. Not a lot of consistency from him either. Um, looking at run defense, uh, only three guys graded out in the seventies, Ladarius Hamilton, Razul Douglas, and Adrian Amos. Not great when nobody along the defensive line and no linebackers are there. Chris Barnes did have a 68.9. We could round that up. You could technically round up Rashawn Gary if you want, 67.6. Guys that did poorly, Devondre Campbell, Henry Black, Preston Smith, Kenny Clark, Kingsley Kiki, and Dean Lowry. Speaking of Preston Smith, um, I've kind of mentioned this, but he was good in, let's say, the first three weeks, bad until from then until week nine, and has had a bit of a resurgence. I know this isn't his best day, but 78, 88, and basically a 70. Uh, it's nice to see him kind of, kind of kind of like Eric Stokes in a way. Good and then bad and kind of, kind of getting his groove back a little bit. Tackling again was phenomenal for the team. Um, pretty much everybody did well out of 14 players. Um, the fourth lowest was a 66.8 Kingsley Kiki. You can kind of round that up. Chris Barnes was at a 62. Devondre Campbell, though, 41, and Henry Black, 33, were the two guys that were not getting it done. Um, pass rush, nobody on this team really grades out well. Pass rush grades, that almost never happens. But Rashawn Gary, Preston Smith, and Kingsley Kiki in the 70s. And then coverage, as expected, Razul Douglas is at the top with a 91. Chris Barnes, though, this is actually where he shined the most. 87.2 overall grade. Um, again, we'll get into the stats in a minute, but that's... That's really impressive. And then Eric Stokes with a 70.7. Savage and Burks were mediocre. Henry Black, Devondre Campbell, Adrian Amos, and Chandon uh, Chandon Sullivan were all in the 40s, so not great. Looking at pressure statistics, 19 total pressures for the team, one for Dean Lowry, one for Chris Barnes, which was completely, it was not even a designed pass rush. So this is what Kenny Clark, um, I think last year or the year before, had like an elite pass rush grade because he had like two pressures on zero attempts, because <laughs> they were all impromptu, right? The, the quarterback rolls out, and he just went and got them. Uh, that, Tipa Galea had one pressure on 19 attempts, so not a great day for him. Um, Kenny Clark, three pressures, 34, as I said. Rashawn Gary, four pressures on 23 attempts and a sack. Not terrible numbers. 
Uh, Kingsley Kiki, four pressures, 24, very similar. And Preston Smith, five pressures on 32. So nobody was super elite, but those three guys did a great job staying uh, in front of the numbers as far as 10%. Uh, Looking at the stop numbers, and again, negative play for the offense. These are tackles. Preston Smith, one. Rashawn, one. Ladarius Hamilton, one. Amos had two. Obviously, we know one of those two. Razul Douglas had two. Kenny Clark had three. Chris Barnes had four. Dude just had a great day. Forced fumbles, obviously, Rashawn Gary. And then finally, looking at coverage, um, Razul Douglas was targeted the most, but you want to know how to get a 91 overall grade. 10 targets, three receptions, 79 yards, a touchdown, a pick, and two pass breakups. And again, the 54-yarder was the long one if, if that just didn't happen. And again, you can't just take it away, but man, what does that leave? Two receptions, 25 yards, an interception, and two pass breakups. I mean, it was it was so close to being about a perfect performance, but... Anyways, Eric Stokes was targeted nine times, but only three of those were caught for 20 yards with a pass breakup. That's a, that is a perfect day, in my opinion. I, I, I never am going to ask any corner ever to have a better day than that. Nine targets, three receptions, 20 yards, and a pass breakup? Good Lord. Now, there were a couple opportunities for touchdowns and everything else because, again, he just refuses to turn his head around, and the few times he does turn his head around, he gets so lost, it's just it's ugly. Hopefully, he can figure that out, but... Perfect day as far as statistics are concerned. Chris Barnes, six targets, five receptions, but only 30 yards and a pass breakup. Shannon Sullivan, three targets, two receptions, 98 yards and a touchdown. You can understand why he didn't grade out very well. Henry Black, three targets, three receptions, 25 yards. Uh, Devondre Campbell, three targets, two receptions, 20 yards. Adrian Amos, two targets, two receptions, 16 yards, a touchdown and a pass breakup. And Darnell Savage, one target, one reception, 14 yards. Surprisingly, special teams actually graded out quite well. I guess it's not that surprising. We're starting to see guys do a little bit of a better job um, with blocking and tackling and whatnot. But Chris Barnes, Razul Douglas, Henry Black, Equinemius, and Dominique Daphne all graded out well. I don't think I've ever seen five. It's rare to find one guy in the 70s. We had five this week. Um, Bad grades, Steve Wortel, as usual, at the very bottom is our long snapper. Above him is Tyler Davis. Those are the two guys that did a really bad job. Uh, Mason Crosby, 54 overall grade with that missed field goal. Corey Bajorquez with a 54 overall grade. I don't know what it takes to get a good grade as a punter uh, with PFF's uh, grading system. I have no idea. But five attempts, 212 yards, 42.4 yards per attempt, 39.8 net, 61 yards was his longest because he just doesn't have a day without a 60-yard punt, obviously. Four of his five were kicked inside the 20. Only one of them was returned for 13 yards. 3.88 3.88 was the hang time. That's probably why. There was a lot of line drives in there. 3.88 is pretty low, but whatever. Didn't seem to be a problem. Anyways, I'm going to leave it at that. You folks have yourselves a fantastic whatever day it is. Wednesday? Is it Wednesday? Anyways, have a great day. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. <laughs>